Hey everybody, welcome to season 11 of the Entrepreneur Experiment podcast with me, Gary Fox. Today we're in Cork, we're recording in the beautiful new Iconic Offices building for our first ever recording outside of Dublin. We've come down here to chat to Joe and John from Work Vivo. They have started one of the biggest success stories of Irish tech companies in the last 10 years. They have an incredibly unusual story. They started their business with no idea what the business was going to be. This is a story that is going to give you the templates and frameworks to start your own business, no matter what that is. Quick shout out to my sponsor, Sage. Sage is the number one provider of payroll, finance, and HR software to small and medium-sized enterprises all across the globe. Find out more about Sage, click the link in the description below. Now, let's get straight into my chat with John and Joe from Work People. John and Joe, welcome to the pod. Thanks very much, Gary very slick new surroundings we find ourselves in we're not used to such luxurious surroundings for the new iconic building here in cork so we had to come down just to see you two thanks very much no it's it's gorgeous it's uh yeah it's pretty slick nice intimate uh, setting here but uh no lovely no great to be here so people will know you from work vivo but the question i had is why co-founders why co-founders uh, why co-founders uh, maybe Maybe I might start with our story of why we got together. Yeah. Because um, I think it's a little bit unorthodox, fair mm. to say, Joe, right? So, um, Joe and I had worked together in a company called Core HR. Um, Joe was CTO there. I was ultimately CEO there. And we got to know each other, got to know each other's capabilities. Uh, fast forward a few years, and I had left Core HR. Joe was off doing something different. And literally, we got together for a few cups of coffee, talked about starting a company, and we committed to starting a company uh, before we knew what we were going to build, which is a very uh, unusual way to go about things. People normally think, yeah, you've got this burning idea, you're waiting for years to, to just get the opportunity to build. That wasn't our story. Our story was, yeah, let's commit to starting a company. I think, uh, for me, I I knew what Joe's capability was. I've I've described Joe before as a once in a generation technology guy and for me if I was ever going to start a company it was going to be with Joe um, and we literally we started and you know first month was trying to figure out okay what are we going to build right or it was first two months <laughs> actually and we we started with um, we were just chatting earlier with like looking at loyalty um, Alec and a squid um, and then we started looking at recruitment and then we figured out, no, it's not really for us. But we had actually made a little bit of ground on recruitment. But this is all in the first eight weeks. And then once we started looking at uh, engagement, communication, we just, I suppose we just found we were passionate on that. But I, I think it goes back to why co-founders. For me, I had huge respect for Joe based on working with him in core HR. And I just felt, okay, we did not know what we were going to build. But I had confidence that you know we have very different skill sets, and uh, just for me, I felt confident it was a, it was a good fit. I love that story. You've started strong there with that. We didn't know what we were going to build, but we were going to start a company because everyone's always looking for like, what's the blueprint? What's the answer? There must be one way to start, and there's a million ways. Every single guest I've had on has had a different way. Some bootstrap, some venture. Some would never bootstrap. Some would never venture. But go back, had you, I'll get you to pull the mic a little bit closer to you. Had you, um, like, was this something you talked about a good few times? Was this something when you were in core that you're like, oh, one day we're going to do this? You know, what was, because that is a very unconventional way to start. And I love it. Yeah, I, I don't think a what like, we, I don't think when we were in core, we, we ever talked about starting a business together. But I think we obviously built up a very strong relationship and a very, you know, as John put it, a very strong respect for one another. Um, and I think, that kind of comes back to that that like white co like white co-founder right it's you i think when you have um if you're a, if you're a solo founder it can be very difficult to be able to do everything that you need to do to start a company and to be successful at it and you know i've been part of companies since core hr where i've kind of seen firsthand just how challenging that can be um and you know i think you know john mentioned that kind of mutual respect like for me like when when we were starting the company I knew that by working with John that we were going to have, you know, an exponentially larger chance of being successful. Um, and I knew that because I knew that John would complement exactly the, the gaps that I had with, within my own skill set. Um, so, like, one of the things that, like, I would say, like, straight off the bat is that 
John is an incredibly positive person. And, you know, I think if you asked, if you asked anybody who works at Work Vivo today, you know, all, all the people, regardless of where they're based, I think the one thing that, if you ask them for one word about John, I think they'd say positive. Um, you know, John builds on positive energy. He's a very positive outlook on things. I'm a more logical person. I'm a techie. I, I was I, loving to see how you're going to frame <laughs> this. <laughs> no, like, I mean, I, I, I tend to, like, look at all the scenarios. And a lot of them are, you know, things could go wrong. Things can be, can be, can be negative. John always frames things in the positive from the start. And, like, I, I, I get an energy off that. Um, and I find it, you know, it really helps me. Um, so that, that, that's kind of how, I suppose, it, it kind of came to be. Um, I think, like, interesting in terms of, like, the, the, the founding journey, like, for us, I had actually been part of a couple of startups uh, before we started Work Vivo. So I had kind of gotten an opportunity to see exactly what I didn't want to do. <laughs> um, I knew I didn't want to be a CEO, for example. I'd been there, done that, and uh, and, and found that it wasn't, it, it, it didn't really work for me. Um, I knew that I needed somebody who had the skills that John has to, to, um, to be successful. And, you know, we'd had such a strong relationship at our time in CORE that when we kind of sync back up, we'd obviously kept in touch over the years, of course. Um, but when we sync back up, it was, you know, there was just an, an instant energy there that I think both of us latched onto. And it didn't really matter what we built. We just knew that if we combined, you know, that energy, we would do something that uh, would be meaningful. In terms of the, like, the journey and, like, the approach that we've taken – like early on, like we didn't really talk about do we bootstrap, do we do we go and fundraise, do we get investment, all of that kind of thing. We f- we focus more on like what do we want to get out of this. We want to we want to have a laugh. We want to enjoy this. We want to we want to get up in the morning and feel like we're having fun. We're doing something we love. You know, we're in a fortunate enough position that we can do that. So why wouldn't we? Um, so you started with the end in mind, almost. We started with the end in mind, and and I think at the very start, the end was actually probably not less ambitious, but like it was probably less maybe grand than our vision for Work Vivo is now. You know, I think we, we both wanted to work together. We wanted to have fun. We wanted to build something meaningful. We wanted to, um, you know, do something that would create a very good life for ourselves and all of that kind of thing. And for the people who, who became part of the business. Um, but I think the, the, the kind of the big, big ambition came much later. Um, at the start, it was more about creating a, creating a, a great company. Um, that's really interesting because a lot of people get fixated on that oh you're not thinking big enough you're not going to make it i hate this phrase make a dent in the universe everyone feels they need to have Mm. that day one Mm. so i want to explore that idea of the two of you just kind of coming together and going right let's do something (laughs) because that's always the other question is like oh when is the time right how will i know so how did you know that this unconventional way was the way forward I I think like when we got together, it was probably timing as well, right? So timing had played into it. Um, I had like Core HR had been acquired. It was twelve months after that that I I stepped away. Um, so I was enjoying a little bit of time off at the time. I think it was a very opportune moment for Joe as well. So I think you know we had we could have talked about starting a company twelve months prior, but I I just don't think the timing would have been right. So I think it was it was timing. It was timing and. It's funny, you know, we when you're starting a company, because I think a lot of people put themselves under pressure in terms of if you're going to start a company, you have to have this amazing idea that nobody has ever thought of before. And for us, we didn't put ourselves under that pressure. I think like we we wrote down um, a lot of like criteria or prereqs for anything we were going to start or build, and and one of them was, you know, it had to be like a SaaS. Like that. It was obviously going to be a SaaS software company. That was our expertise. It was probably going to be in the greater HR space. So we started writing these things down. But one thing we wrote down was that there had to be pre-existing competition. Um, and like that pro- kind of feels counterintuitive to a lot of people where it's like, why would you jump into a space where there's competition? But for us, it's, well, there's there's a market there, right? There's a there's a validated market. If there's competition, it means th- there are buyers in that market. And for us, then if it's like okay, y- if you jump in, or if we jump in, we I suppose we felt confident that we would do things a little bit differently, a little bit better, have a different angle on it. And I think once you once you're in, uh, and if you win that first customer or that second customer, customers will lead you in a certain direction anyway. And it's about listening to it and. Um, but we we literally just like jumped in, didn't worry about that. There's this competition in this kind of wider space, um, and it kind of 
evolved from there. But one thing we always talk about as well is like some people have this like grand ambition to hey we want to go public by this date or um and we've never had that um not because we're not ambitious like we're savagely ambitious but it's always been just about like realizing our potential and let's realize our potential uh, do all the right things and see where it gets us because i think if you predefine the outcome has to be this then is it a case then that anything other than that is is a failure and um I don't think either of us buy into that. So for us, it's about, okay, let's enjoy the journey. Let's let's just realize our potential, do all the right things to realize our potential. And a lot of good things kind of happen um, by taking that approach. Yeah, you can lose focus on all the open doors. You're walking by all these open doors yeah. of opportunity when you're like, no, I have to get through that yeah. window at the bottom of the corridor. That's the only way. Talk to me about the process of the day one. You're like, right, new company, here we go. <laughs> Uh, oh, what are you doing today, lads? Oh, we're going in to figure out what our new company is going to do. Bring me back to that day because I'm I'm really interested in that whole process of like day one, right? Yeah, I I um I've mentioned before actually. There's there's a there's a great phrase uh, that I suppose we have in Ireland, right? Which is it's kind of a should God love us, and I think that's the phrase my wife would have used when she saw me going out to work every day. Um, <laughs> to work inverted commas. It's like so you don't know what you're building, but you've started a company with Joe, but you've no idea what you're And you're doing. not going to be here all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're, you're at work, inverted commas. And um, there's, there's, we always talk about, you know, the full Monty, where there's a guy that goes off pretending to go to work every day with the briefcase. Yeah. And it, it was a little bit of that. It was like turning up for work um, with Joe, and it's, you know, hey, Joe, do you have any ideas last night? You know, I had this. What ideas did you have? I had this idea. Would this work? Let's... And it was literally like turning up with blank page. Um, what about loyalty? What about recruitment? That's okay. Recruitment sounds. Good. Let's build a prototype on. And it was just a lot of like trial and error. But it was it was literally two months of um, trying to figure out and turning up for work with um, what are we going to work on? It's exciting work. but scary, I'd imagine. Um, I didn't. Th- I don't think it was scary. I don't think it was scary. I think we knew that. Um, like there's a scientific approach you can take to it as well where you go I remember talking to Peter Coppinger from Teamwork on this where you know you just look at the hottest startups that exist in, on the planet who's growing fastest what are they doing okay let's jump into that right and try and do it better or try and do it mm. faster or you know have some sort of differentiation um, so I think we we knew we would get to a good place in terms of like figuring out what the product was Um but it, it took us two months. Maybe we thought we'd do it in a week, right? Which we didn't. But it, <laughs> Two months, it still seems short. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, we I, actually, we joke with that sometimes that we had a pivot. Um, but I don't think you can call it a pivot when it was only, <laughs> we probably invested like six weeks on uh, yeah. of, you know, development time and design time on uh, on the recruitment solution. But um, So how did you go from whiteboard to action? Like how, because I think that's the bit that catches a lot of people. They have the whiteboard and it's like, looks like a murderer's map of how they're going to do all this stuff. How did you go from that to actually going, right, action here, let's let's make some things happen? Um, f- For me, it was probably like securing a customer. Yeah. Um, And I think that's like, we always talk about, you know, don't, don't get too caught up in investment process, focus on winning a customer, right? Because that's the best source of, of capital you're going to get. So for us, um, when we had the recruitment idea, we we approached Morgan McKinley, uh, Brian Murphy in there, Pat Fitzgerald was CEO at the time, and we brought them this idea that we had around recruitment, and it was actually it was actually a pretty good idea, and they really liked it. <laughs> <And> they were <laughs> they were they were like keen to work with us, and like we started a great relationship with them. We met a lot of their senior guys, and. Over the next few weeks, we started figuring out that it wasn't really for us. Um, I think we could have built a really good product there. Um, but I had to go back to Pat and say, hey, Pat, look, we've actually changed our minds. We're not going to build a rec- recruitment solution. Here's what we're thinking of building. And when I explained to Pat what, what we were thinking of building, he really liked that idea as well. And he said, look, let me introduce you to my HR director, um, Helen Gallagher, and we started a relationship with Morgan McKinley that ultimately allowed us validate what we were thinking, validate designs, and then it became 
just naturally very action based because we're meeting a potential customer. We've got a meeting in the diary for next week. What are we going to be able to show? We've got to do design work, dev work for next Wednesday. Once we met them, there was follow up. We'd have to have something ready again for the you know two weeks later. How do you get a customer with no product though? Um, it's, I think, a story and mm. a story is always something that we've I think been um, reasonably strong on in terms of like you can if you have an idea about what you want to build, I think you can tell the story of what it's going to do without actually having a final product and. You know, you can you can use graphics, prototypes, imagery, but I think people buy into a story. And we told we told a, a good story about what we wanted to build because we we knew at a high level what it was what we wanted to do, and it was enough that Morgan McKinley bought into that and really liked it. And then it was about like executing and building those component parts. And and it was similar with Staffordshire University in the UK; they similarly bought into the story we told around what we wanted to build. And I think once you have that, and we had that very early on, they they both strongly bought into it. Then we almost had like early deliverables. Mm, so yeah. it's like before before we had any product, we had deliverables. We had deliverables to customers, our potential customers. And it was, we made commitments, say, hey, do you mind if we come back in two weeks? We'll show you where we got to based on what we talked about. And it just, I think very, very early on, we had... Uh, very focused deliverables based on like customer feedback. You built in accountability very early. Very early. Externally, yeah. which is huge. This is th- the mistake you see people make all the time. They they lock themselves away for 12 to 24 months and re-emerge from their cave with this beautiful product that's completely wrong. Yeah, it's it's funny actually. I, I, I met a startup um, over the last couple of years that were um, bringing a product to market, but they had... They were waiting to develop uh, one component part, but it was a physical part. It was a battery, and um, they were waiting to go to market or to look seek new cost seek customers until they had that ready. And I was making the point: look, you can bring anything that looks like a battery into a into a meeting room with you a demo. People don't need to see the battery working. They need to buy into the story you're telling about what the product ultimately will do. Mm. And that, if you I suppose introduce that accountability, you. The earlier you get customer validation, customer feedback, the better. Because like our product changed quite a lot from in our, our initial concept, all in a good way. But it was it was based on early customer feedback. Early customer feedback based on we like that, we don't like that. This seems to be working. Um, and for us, we did that really, really, really early. Like we ended up going live with our product um, twelve months after we started. But it was it was too like pretty large organizations like Morgan McKinley, a thousand people based all over the world and Staffordshire University, 2000, um, 2000 people in a, in a university in the UK. Um, and that was based on, I think, just getting early accountability, early customer conversations. Um, the alternative would have been build a product in stealth ourselves mm. and, you know, hope that it was working on the right thing. I think as well, like you're not, we certainly weren't walking into those meetings with nothing. Like yeah. I mean, like John mentioned the story, and that was a huge mm. part of it. But we were also showing like Software. prototypes, yeah. proof of concepts, and these were like high fidelity. Like these aren't you know Figma mockups or you know wireframes and things like that. These were they felt like a real product. Yeah. Yes, everything was hard coded in the background and everything like that. But it it, mm. it felt tangibly real. And I think when you can help somebody vis- like visualize what this would actually look like in reality, obviously, look, they know this isn't ready yet, right? But they get enough of a visual that they start to form in their mind, this is how it might work for me. And then, like, what you're looking for in those meetings is, oh, like, it would be great if, you mm. know, and because now they're starting to think about, okay, how do I take this thing that you're showing me and actually apply it to what I need? And you're there, like, scribbling down notes. This saying, is going to be my next question. <laughs> this is going to be the exact question. Because I love when people listen to these pods, they hear great stories, but also want them to get tangible. So I want them to kind of go in and go, ah, been doing it wrong so you've you've touched you've started to answer that question already what would you say and do in these meetings because i think a lot of early stage founders are like ah, oh, it's nerves and it's fear because you don't want to be told no what were you saying and showing them in these meetings yeah i mean it was it was it was something that felt like a product right and i think like i think the key thing with with those meetings is you're going in and like you don't need to be perfect and i think that's something that i think a lot of founders struggle with mm-hmm. right is that 
they see their startup as like a representation of themselves and they don't want to go into a meeting with a prospective customer and feel like they've only got like part of the answer ready. Um, I think, you know, a lot of organizations are more than happy to talk to you about something that's not quite fully baked yet, as long as you can visualize it for them and as long as you can show them what you're thinking. That, that tight feedback loop that we had, like, was incredibly important to our product development process. Um, like, we were, in many ways, there was a lot of luck involved as well, right? I mean, we were lucky to work with two organizations who, like, they put project teams around us um, with, within their organizations to help us uh, to, to build out that first version of that product. Um, so keeping that really tight connection with those customers ultimately allowed us to get from what was you know, something that was held together with sticky tape in the background, um, but it looked okay, um, to something that could actually be rolled out, you know, to a global organization like Morgan McKinley or, or, or a university. So it's, um, I think a lot of it is confidence as well, um, you know, confidence in your ability to execute. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that kind of going back to the co-founder thing, mm. I think we had that confidence, right? We've worked together for seven years at Core HR. We knew that we complemented each other's skill sets. Um, like John knew if, if we needed to build something in product, I'd figure out a way of making it happen. I knew that if we needed to do something to keep a customer happy, John would figure out how to make that happen. We had what we needed. So we had the confidence that, like, no matter what comes out of the conversation with the customer, we'll be able to do, we'll be able to make this happen. Um, and I think prospective customers really pick up on that. Whereas if you're going in kind of standoffish because you're worried about, you know, hey, my product isn't fully baked yet. You don't want them to peep behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you have to be, you have to expose yourself a yeah. little bit because you'll get found out if you don't, right? So it's, um, and, and I think, like John said, if you wait until it's all ready to go, you'll only find out that it's actually really not <laughs> and when, you, when you eventually do make it to market and you realize that all these customers actually need something slightly different to what you've actually built, right? So... So you did all this in 12 months. How did you do that? Was it still the two of you? Were you out there hunting customers and you were in the back end coding furiously? How did it work? I think th I think you just described it. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. I was, I was out hunting customers and, and Joe was, was building, right? We used, we, used, we used to have this running joke <laughs> that like we would just send John up and down on the Cork to Dublin train over and over again because every time that John went on the train from Cork to Dublin or, or coming home, he would meet a prospective customer. Um, so he'd meet randomly, like a <laughs> HR director in, you know, a large multinational would be sitting next to John on the train and he'd be demoing work vivo to them. Meanwhile, John is going like down, the, he's going down the aisle looking at all the pre-booked seats going, name, name, LinkedIn, <laughs> name, LinkedIn, uh, name. You, you actually don't know how, how, how close to the, the mark that is. Um, no, but it's I, cheaper I, than going to the web summit. Yeah, but do, do you know what? I think, like, we we weren't shy about like asking for meetings and asking for look can we, we we're building this thing we've this idea can we can we share it with you um I, we did so much of that like so much of that reached out to people just ask for ask for a meeting right mm. just to show them what we we're building and like there's only a very small percentage of that like comes to anything but a percentage does and like we met some great customers in very just situations i don't know it could be a lunch on the train, whatever it was, but um, I did a lot of demos on the mobile, on the train, and in you know various situations where you're, you're just looking for a meeting, right? And um, and then you're asking for people for introductions, and and I think y you have to do that. Like we did a huge amount of that in the first twelve months, where um, the again it's like the early customer or prospect and it does like some of them didn't become customers obviously but you're still getting very valuable feedback mm. um, and we we did um, we ultimately had a product built within 12 months based on that like accountability deadlines to the prospects that we were working with um, when we were ready to go live like two very significant organizations you know live with our product um, we didn't even have a website so this was uh, and this was a thing we always said that we would uh, we would see how many years we could last without building a website. Because <laughs> yeah. generally, that's the first thing. Let's get a cool logo on a website. Yeah, let's get a cool logo. <laughs> on a web no, we didn't. We we all we had this idea that when we launched our website, it would include video testimonials from customers. I love that. And that's, that's where we worked back from. So yeah. so two testimonials, two quality video testimonials from customers 
would be on our, the first website when we launched, and we were working back from that. Um, so when Stafford University ultimately, like a lot of hard work, got them live, hugely successful, same with Morgan McKinley. Um, in parallel then, we were like getting the videos produced, both of them signed up to do those testimonials, and they were very powerful. So, so when we launched 12 months after we'd formed, we felt like a bigger company because mm. the website mm. was talking about a great product that had got customer validation. We knew there was customers successfully using it. We had customer testimonials up there. Two customers, like you would think that's representative of you know, a bigger customer yeah, population. Yeah, they're just the two they're that just did the two it. Yeah, we picked, right? But there were our only two customers at the time. I love that working backwards. <laughs> I, I think that's such a hack. Before we move off this, what was the criteria? You talked about the criteria of, of do's and don'ts when you were doing it. Can you share some of those? Because I think that's really powerful for how people think about starting. Um, I think the biggest do for us was speed. And mm. I think we talked about speed all of the time. Um, and almost like before we started, when we were listing the criteria that I mentioned earlier, you know, around, okay, it has to be a SaaS product, has to be pre-existing competition. But speed was the one thing that we both agreed we had to have. Um, so everything we did was, you know, meet a prospect, talk about something that might be good, great in the product. And, you know, two weeks later, we're back and we're showing them. And it's not prototype. It's like it's in the product. Um, and I suppose for me, I was lucky Joe has the capability to build product at serious pace. So I think we always put ourselves under pressure for, okay, let's let's have this done by next week, let's mm. have this done by and it just I think we've 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 continued that culture in the com- company, thankfully. It's like we, we definitely um I, I suppose we don't buy into the or your roadmap is a f- three-year thing, and it's like for us, it's like okay, what are we doing this quarter? What's next quarter? But we've we've built a very healthy culture of delivering product at pace, mm. um, and I think that's been there from the start. Yeah, and I think I think it actually stems from like when we were at Core HR, like we had that kind of speed of execution piece in there as well, and it allowed us to compete with companies like you know many multiples the um, the time or the size of the of, of the business that we were part of. Um, so it was like a superpower. Um, you know, being able to deliver, you knew you were competing against slow moving beasts where if, mm. you know, a customer gave that company a bit of feedback, you were going to like, they were going to be waiting a year, two years before they might see the actual output of that, you know, and then if you're there on the other side of the, uh, of it and you're able to deliver that in a week or two weeks, it's, it's totally game changing. And I mean, we, we definitely saw that. Um, become a superpower for work for you. How well. do you bake that in? Because I think that's class, and you see that in massive organizations that are super successful, Amazon, Tesla, SpaceX. They all work to these like in almost insane, inverted commas, deadlines. How do you keep that as you grow from 2 to 10 to 12? How do you go with that? I, th- I think w- one thing that helped us, and we, we do, like we had a scenario where like, very early in, I suppose, uh, in, the, in the company, we landed ourselves in an opportunity for one of the biggest technology firms in the world. And we ended up getting to the last six there. We'd only five people in the company at the time, right? Last six, last three, down to the last two. And we were in the last two, and we were actually up against Facebook, uh, their workplace product. So we'd five people in our company. They had, like, how many, I think it's like... 20,000, Yeah, I think it's about (laughs) 90,000 in Facebook overall now, right? But... um, and we were down to the last two, so we were competing against them. We're over in Silicon Valley um, doing bake-offs, and like 40% of our company was there, right? It was <laughs> myself and the guy, Kieran. Um, and we, we, when we demoed the product and we were in the sessions, we took note of like mostly positive feedback, but they also had feedback on, it's missing this, we'd love to have this, or it would be great if it had that. And I remember we left um, San Francisco on a Thursday afternoon after doing a morning demo. And on Friday morning, we released a video back to the customer saying, hey, guys, great to meet you yesterday. We're back in Ireland now. Thanks for the feedback, Jim, on that feature. Um, The good news is overnight we've been able to do that. Uh, The second feature you talked about, We've also done that. Sarah, thanks for your feedback. We've done that as well. Um, the other features you mentioned, uh, we're going to work through the weekend. We'll have those on Tuesday. 
and it just became this like insane delivery at like at pace listening to the customer delivering on it but we we tell that story to new employees as well and it's become a famous story in the company and it sets for us it sets the tone of look this is how we want to respond and um and we didn't like we won that opportunity right it was like they they placed a bet on a five person company which was which was insane um but it gave us gave us the credibility then to bounce on from there mm. um but i think that culture you can you can take like you can plan 6 months to do something or you can plan 2 weeks and the product the ultimate product you come up with after 6 months it's probably not going to be a whole lot better than what you produce in 2 weeks um but you have to have the right culture supporting it as well poor joe sitting at home going <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> I don't work any other way, to be honest with you. It's um, but no you one said we do what? <laughs> when? <laughs> I, but I, I think I think a lot of companies are guilty of like implementing process way too early yeah. as well. Like yeah, I yeah. mean, like yeah. you know, when I think a lot of a lot of founders, you know, look for inspiration in you know like the big successful companies, like some of the ones you mentioned, the likes of Spotify, the li- like the likes of these companies, right? And mm-hmm. they've they've come up with these amazing processes for how they build software, for how they you know support their customers all of this they've had to come up with those processes because of their scale and their size so like trying to emulate that Mm. when you're you know a tiny startup company with you know a handful of people it just doesn't make any sense um and it's like it's even the same within product like you know you, you see a lot of companies um like all those big tech companies they they use this kind of technology um infrastructure like called microservices and then you see all these startup founders trying to build technology the exact same way mm. even though it makes no sense whatsoever because you don't have the problems yet that that can actually help help solve um i know we, we, we talk about this every so often as well it's like it's um like premature optimization of of, of things right it's like you're solving imaginary problems yeah. you're doing the one percent uh, when 80 percent is still hanging out the back yeah, yeah I- I- exactly it's like why why are you why are you focused on these things where like any work that you do is actually not going to convert into anything um, other than a process that's actually going to slow you down mm. um, when you could just be, you know, building or, you know, doing whatever it is that you need this to do. This comes to back to your stage. earlier point though about experience and having known what you don't want to do. I think yeah. that's crucially important. There's this myth of the founder of being this like 18-year-old prodigy who just came out of the womb coding, <laughs> just, n- just intuitively <laughs> knew, oh, this is just how it works. When in reality, it's through the process you outlined earlier of, you know, don't like that that definitely doesn't work we shouldn't do that because of x yeah no exactly I, I, like i mean there are there are plenty of examples out there of that 18 year old prodigy who builds something amazing but i think they're outliers right it's like for the vast exactly. majority of people it's it's much more about you know being agile about how you build your company and responding to you know if if you go to the market and and there's signals there telling you that hey, what you're building maybe isn't exactly right, and you might need to change it a little bit. Like knowing to respond to that and actually to to adapt your products and to adapt your company to, to to fit that. What was the very first idea you had? You said you went out to Morgan McKinley with that. What was that, and what did it become? You mean the the, the idea that we didn't follow through yeah. on? So that was we were going to become the Uber of recruitment. Um, so it was the whole idea was we would build a recruitment platform where freelance recruiters based anywhere in the world working from home this is pre-covid as well so it would have been very relevant working from anywhere um could look on this platform see positions that companies were trying to fill and and grab them you know as in i'm taking this one but a company on the other side could put their positions up they could filter say it's saying hey i i just going i want to go with four star recruiters or above so it's all based on ratings but essentially, you would have a freelance recruiter working anywhere who's filling positions, right? Working to fill these positions. A lot more cost effective. Um, the technology was a key differentiator for us as well. Like we had, we had in our prototypes, we'd built in like video interviews. It was almost like swipe, swipe left, swipe right on candidates if you liked them. Um, the, the, the concept was very, like it was, would have been a very slick technology solution. The reason we didn't proceed with it was we started interviewing potential freelance recruiters 
and it kind of brought it home to us that okay so if we want to go live in liverpool or manchester or san francisco we're going to have to seed it with freelance recruiters that we trust and it just felt like okay this feels like a lot of heavy lifting to get quality quality freelance recruiters that we trust to get it off the ground um and ultimately we came back to you no know, do you know what that we kind of lose control there a little bit mm. and we we need to bring it back to just the software that we've got more control of the quality of what we output and more control over the quality of what ultimately the customer experience is and that's that's why we didn't go ahead with it distribution is all, always huge people have these great ideas for products oh wouldn't that be class if but the thing you outlined there distribution how do you get it to people yeah but I th- ultimately i think it would have been i think it would have been successful um i think we if we had committed to it i think we would have done a really good job with it and i think the technology solution that we um had prototyped was very 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 slick and would have been a differentiator um it it, it boils down to like i suppose you c- you can do anything you want but c- you can't do everything right and it felt like what we ultimately uh, jumped into was a better fit for us um, and we could be more successful with that at what point did you go okay we're going to change um it, it was probably like not more than t- two months in um because i think we were we were we were impatient as well to like start working on something right mm. and joe was building prototype software but like we wanted to be working on some, something that ultimately we felt yeah this is it um and i think like two months in we were we were looking at the whole area of engagement what what makes a difference in terms of employee engagement what helps shape the culture of a company how do you how do you get people emotionally bought into what the company's trying to do and the more we started researching it and talking about it the more we realized we're actually really into this both of us personally were academically interested in it and personally interested in it and it just it just immediately felt right and then we started looking at okay what things make a difference recognition makes a huge difference communication makes a huge difference like people are much more likely to be bought into what the company is about if they feel informed about what's going on in the company they have a greater sense of ownership things like community how do you build community into the organization and facilitate the natural communities that exist in the organization which if you do you're much more likely to have an engaged organization um, so we started looking at these concepts, like these pillars, um, like recognition, like communication, like measurement of engagement. And ultimately, we just started trying to design those things into a, a product. And it, it literally became a whiteboard exercise out in Douglas and Cork, where here are the components we want to build into a product. How do we design a product around them? How do we build them in? And it was, it was just Joe and myself whiteboard trying to do that and ultimately what fell out of that design process was work fever a lot of inter- iterations <laughs> in between um but uh, but that's ultimately how it how it started i think i think as well like it, a lot of it comes back to kind of gut feel as well right it's and i think you know especially when you probably have the luxury of experience you, mm. you get to develop a strong gut feeling um and funny enough i probably trust john's gut feeling more than i even trust my own gut feeling <laughs> at this stage um but i think you know when something is right and both of us had that feeling about that ori- that original idea there was just something not mm. that wasn't sitting comfortable mm. for both of us and the more and more we started to go down the engagement road and and to explore it and look at the research behind it and all of that we could just feel this the energy is right. right it's yeah. this this is where we're this is where we're supposed to be this is yeah. what the playing field that we're supposed to be in and I think, you know, knowing to trust our gut and say, okay, look, we've done we've done a lot of work on this other thing, but in the greater scheme of things, it's not that much work, mm-hmm. right? So, like, it's not, it's not a big deal for us to, like, <laughs> we'll look back and regret it if we don't trust our gut now and yeah. it turns out to have been the wrong decision. And, not, and as John said, not just because, it, like, it could have been successful, but, you know, I think both of us, we probably wouldn't have been as happy. <laughs> building mm. it and it wouldn't have actually delivered on those original objectives of starting this thing in the first place which was to actually really enjoy what we were doing how do you keep an open mind though because some people get very emotionally attached to these things they go oh, this is this is it and they'll they'll, they'll just steer I, down this wrong path I, I, you? I think you have to leave emotions out of it as much mm. as you can right i think like in like the emotion side of things i think is important when you when you think about 
like am I enjoying it right but as like I remember um I I saw Ray Nolan uh, speaking at an event here in Cork years ago and uh somebody asked him a question and they're like he had said something about like selling shares in one of his early companies um kind of early on um and obviously those shares would have gone on to be worth significantly more later on and somebody like how could you do how could you sell part of your baby <laughs> and um I'm not sure if we're, we're a little curse on here but <laughs> oh curse away <laughs> um but ray said it's like it's a company it's not a fucking baby <laughs> um and it's like you know it's it's i think people get too emotionally yeah. attached and it's like you, you need to think about things a little bit like more it is a business right at the end of the day it's a business and you want to enjoy it you want to you, you want to have fun you want to do all of those things but i think if you get too emotionally attached i think it's a dangerous place to be because i think you you, you run the risk of going into a situation with a customer where a customer tells you i don't like it I, this doesn't work for me and you know you slaved over it for the last you know number of weeks building this thing and ultimately the customer doesn't like if if you're precious about it mm. then like it's not going to work right because you have to be you have to be responsive like i mean we used, we even early on i mean there'd be times when i'd spend a lot of time building something and I bring it in and show it to John, and he'd always let me down gently, right? But <laughs> this is why I asked you this question. I was like, I want to kind of fire and talk to the guy who's in behind coding here because I'm sure it's a lot of man hours. So, he, well, but John would know how to approach it with me, right? He'd know <laughs> to kind of come in softly and say, "Oh, there's just like just something." Right? You're looking great today, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, he'd bring in the coffee, and you know, he'd <laughs> but um, but he'd know like and and you know, at first you might be like, "Oh, I've just spent loads of time doing this thing," and it's like I don't want to spend yeah. more time doing it again. Or, or, but you know, you'd know he's right. Like he's he's spotting something that it's funny because like I'm the tech and product guy, right? But John is like an incredibly strong eye for a good product. Like, he knows what good looks like when it comes to product. So again, it comes back to that trusting, right? It's like if John tells me hey, something's not right here, like I trust it because I know he sees these small little things. And it's funny, it could be something like that, you know, your average engineer would look at it and go, oh my God, like really? It's like, it's two pixels out to the right and you want me to move? Like what difference does it make? And you may not have a customer screaming at you saying, hey, this doesn't look right because they mightn't perceive that specific thing as being wrong. But it's like when a lot of these little things add up, then you know that creates a kind of an overall perception that I think is really important, right? So, um, so yeah, I think you can't be precious about your products. Like your product is going to evolve; it might change completely in terms of what it does over time, based on what you're hearing from customers, what you're hearing from the market. And yeah, as 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 Ray said, it's 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 not a mm. baby; it's a, it's a it's a company. I love um, how you you guys take such a rational, logical approach to it. You take all emotion out of it. Was there a moment where you're like, oh, I think we're on it. I think we've we've hit it after these months of kind of like tweaking and whiteboarding. I think we've kind of hit the hit the jackpot here. Was there a moment or a, a series of events that happened where you're like, we're going, this is it? I, I, I think there were many moments, Gary, to be honest with you. Like there's like milestones. Like we've been lucky enough to have like so many milestones that we've enjoyed. Like your first customer contract. Like that was a that was a pinch me moment, right? When Morgan McKinley ultimately signed as a customer, that was a real pinch me moment. It's like, okay, we have a customer who's willing to pay money for our product. Like, there's something here, right? Um, and then you know when you hire your first employee, because we actually had four customers, um, and one of them like not insignificant customers as well. The likes of Vox brought three thousand people based in the U.S., Philippines, Ireland, um, and there was only two of us in the company. So you'd four, you'd double the amount of customers than, than staff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we joked at one point how 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 far we could take it uh, just with just the two of us. <laughs> um, we hiring our first employees like huge milestone for us. Um, then we you know you win like one of the largest tech companies in the world like massive milestone and even being selected above workplace by Facebook for that was like was an incredible like boost of confidence for for us. Um, and then, like, we got to meet Eric Yuan from Zoom. We showed Eric our product. He wanted to become an investor. We didn't ask him to become an investor. And it's like, oh, my God, that's another pinch me moment. It's mm. like Eric Yuan from Zoom wants to invest in our company, you know, based on. How had you guys funded this to now? Um, we, very early on, we became a HBSU. So we had some 
initial funding. That so anyone not familiar, high potential startup in EI, what does that mean? It's It means that I suppose e, EI um, have recognized you as a high potential startup and they then become willing to invest. I think it was up to a quarter of a million. I think it might be a bit more than that now. Um, so we had some private investment, quarter of a million. We had uh, Enterprise Ireland's quarter of a million investment. We had Eric who became an investor. And that's how we, we funded it initially. But I think the very early days, actually the first year, we funded it on very little where mm. we were not taking anything out of the company. We started with a little bit of like seed funding, mm. very small. But we had we had very little cost, right? And we were we were paying ourselves like next to nothing. Um we didn't spend money on it unnecessarily and um I suppose we were looking to win customers to get that additional funding right it wasn't uh, early on it wasn't about oh let's let's build an invest uh, 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 an impressive investment deck Mm. right it was for us it was like let's build an an impressive product win customers and on the back of that yeah you can start looking at an investment or whatever but um, i think we were just like very 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 lean um, at the at the start and i think we actually thought we were going to bootstrap the company um, at one point um, indefinitely. And um, what changed? What changed? I think a couple of things changed. Um, Eric becoming an investor um, was significant. And I think, you know, at the time, we were spending a bit of time over in Silicon Valley um, meeting Eric, meeting prospective customers, meeting some customers we had signed. And I think you, 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 you get. For me, there's like there's a huge energy that comes from Silicon Valley and the companies that have gone a certain way over there. And I remember one conversation with Eric. It was like, "How many sales guys have you got? You, you know, you're not going to conquer the world based on you know. You need to consider a bigger investment." And ultimately, when we were weighing up, would we go for a bigger investment and do a Series A? Um, the decision point was, if no matter what, if we go for a Series A we're signed up for an adventure here, right? Mm. And it's going to take us to places where we would not get to on a bootstrapped uh, approach. And I think we that's what ultimately we signed up for is, yeah, let's go for it. There's like there's a huge market opportunity. Um, and But it was it was almost a road not taken, right? Bootstrap yeah. versus... Um, but I think taking the bootstrapped, like DNA, the Core HR was a very much a bootstrapped company. I think taking that into... Workvivo was very healthy as well in terms of like it's very it's it's uh it's it's uh I think the way to go now investors look for you to be capital efficient that wasn't the case over the last few years but we've always taken a very capital efficient uh, approach and very sensible approach to growing the company uh, which I think is is sort of smart. Just give people some perspective because it it sounds like this is a long term company in terms of you've been doing it for years and years and years but you didn't start that long ago. No, it's. Five years, we we had we we celebrated properly our five year anniversary uh, in May of this year. Uh, yeah, it's like for us, it's kind of hard to believe. Uh, five years uh, has passed pretty quickly, um, but yeah, I think even like versus, I suppose companies that we would compete against, um, they've all been around a lot longer than mm. us. Sure, like that's incredible growth and achievement in those five years considering the, the origins of you two guys coming up with the whiteboard what's next for work Vivo? what's your i know you don't plan grand visions but what are you working on currently what's getting you two guys excited right now and a few things i think like our product we've got like we've got a huge hugely exciting vision for where we can take the product um i think right now the employee experience is one that has moved to the digital world, right? So, uh, and we think about employee experience in terms of, like, what's the desired output of a great employee experience? And for us, the desired output of a great employee experience is greater emotional commitment to the organization. So if you if you plan and build a deliberate, great employee experience around trying to create this greater emotional commitment to the organization, lots of brilliant things happen in terms of, like it becomes a really great place to be for employees because it's not just for the company. Like if employees are bought into what the purpose of the organization is about, the values of the organization, the ambition, the culture, 
it's a great place to work. And we're excited about like the fact that that now has become a digital objective, like influencing and shaping that employee experience is largely digital. And we've built our product around um, trying to be the digital heart of the organization, which influences the, you know, shaping the culture and communication and um, bringing the purpose alive. And it's not, it's not going to change in terms of people aren't suddenly just all going to go back to the office. So the opportunity is huge. And the kind of things we're thinking about now um, for next year, I think we'll just take the product to a different level again. Um, like it's funny, even things that over the last couple of years, like we're, we're doing a podcast right now, right? But organizations are starting to do more and more internal podcasts uh, because podcasts are a great way to connect to people, very intimate, fireside conversation. So in a 10,000-person in a organization, 100,000-person organization, organization a leader doing a podcast that's for an internal audience is an incredible way of mm. bringing people along. I had this conversation with an investor on Saturday, Saturday morning. I was chatting to him and he was like, oh, I'd love to you know, interview the companies and then send that podcast out to our potential pool of investors and let them decide. I was like, that is an absolute yeah. no-brainer. I've been pitching that to people for years. Yeah, and, and we've seen this. We've actually like we've built things like podcasting into our platform, which are you know, things we, we would not have could ever consider building a few years ago um but i think it probably all goes back to look the market is huge we've assembled an incredible incredible team we've a we've a gorgeous culture in the company um we're very ambitious and i think for, for me it's about just like realizing our, our potential and see where see where it gets us i've made it 50 minutes into the interview to asking you for the future of work question but we <laughs> we have to touch on it Everyone is panicking and a bit scared about like, you know, offline, online, office, non-office. What's your views on what is happening and what will come down the road? Yeah, I think <coughs> it's it's funny because I think there was, a, there was probably a two-year period where like you couldn't go five minutes into a conversation without talking about the future of work. I tried so hard <laughs> to resist till now. <laughs> um, but I think I think the one thing that we have seen over the last couple of years is that like nobody can really predict it um, because it's just constantly changing. I mean, you know, we've got like you know, it wasn't that long ago that like Twitter were saying everybody could work from home, and now look like look at the changes that have happened in Twitter over the last week, right? So, I think the reality is is that we're, like nobody really knows. Um, like the way we look at it, like obviously we look at it from our own perspective in terms of what kind of like work um, uh, environment do we want to create as an employer. Um, and for us, like we have found that flexibility, like remote, come into the office if you like, like having that flexibility has just worked really, really well. Mm -hmm not just for the people who work in WorkVivo, but also for us as a business, for as a, as a company. You know, I think it, it's it's helped us to build a better culture, to create an environment that people really enjoy, um, that kind of freedom of work. You know, we've you know had people who will go off and they'll travel for a week and, you know, and work from a different location, all of this. And you just, there's an energy that kind of comes mm. from that as well, right? Magic. So, I mean, so it's, it's, it's worked really well for us. And I think, you know, we have no plans to kind of really change that massively, right? I mean, like, we we will as we expand and as you know we hire more people in different locations like we will need office space and we'll need pl you know places where people can go and work and i think like one thing that we definitely are seeing a lot more of is a lot more of like traditional office space being used as more of a collaboration space mm -hmm. so people like teams coming together that maybe are geographically um dispersed coming together more regularly um to basically collaborate in person um uh, rather than coming in and sitting at a, you know in a cubicle for eight hours and, and and that kind of thing, so I think we're like from our perspective, we're seeing a shift in terms of like the purpose of the office. But I think at the same time, when you look at the wider world and you look at you know a lot of large organisations with you know changing their tune a little bit in terms of you know maybe it's not so much about hybrid or not so much about work from home anymore. We want to bring everybody back into the office. You know the reality is is that's going to affect how things work for everybody i don't think we know yet i think it's probably going to take another mm. you know six to twelve months before we kind of really see where things are going to settle um but yeah i think i think the main thing is adapting like is just adapting to 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 the <laughs> whatever that in that that new world ends up looking looking like um i think f like from our perspective 
giving people choice, like giving people flexibility is incredibly powerful. Um, and I think it's enabled us, you know, to hire people that, you know, at an earlier stage of our journey that we may not have been able to hire if we didn't have this advantage of being able to offer flexibility and things like that. So it's been really good to us and I think we'll continue to, to do that. But um, yeah, as for the wider world, we can make predictions, absolutely. You know, I've, I've made predictions in the past in terms of what way things will look like and some of them have been good, some of them have been bad, but it's, um, I genuinely think it's, it's, it's too volatile right now to be able to accurately detect like what is what is the the way it's actually going it's um, impossible like because like you said like you couldn't have predicted this three years ago you couldn't have predicted two years ago two weeks ago different again yeah. I, I always kind of lo i love when people are honest and go couldn't tell you no <laughs> idea i asked one of my biggest clients a few years ago i was like i would kind of been curious as how he built his thing and he goes i asked him how he knew that the big crash was coming because he sold a huge parcel of land just previous to it and i was like how did you know he goes oh, i was just lucky <laughs> <laughs> he goes couldn't tell you and I, I was I, like what do you think now and he goes couldn't tell you now either <laughs> I think a lot of it is down to intention as well though right in terms of like I think you, like if you rewind the clock a year and a half ago like the jobs market was incredibly competitive like mm. so so competitive and companies were falling all over each other trying to figure out ways of attracting talent to their companies and I think you like you fast forward to today and it's a very different world right I mean it's obviously the environment is changing a lot and for us like it's never been about creating an environment for the sake of creating an environment like it's not it's not about you know trying to score points um over company x right it's it's actually just more about like the people right like the people who are going to come and work here how are they going to be most effective in doing what they want to do like or what they're going to do in our company um so i think if you have the right intentions then it doesn't really matter um what the future of work looks like it's mm. just having the right intentions um in what you're doing would be my view on it but i think if companies feel they have to have the staff in the office for them to work they've hired the wrong people it comes right back to that kind of mindset of like i think you summed it up there beautifully with flexibility mm. it doesn't have to be strictly one yeah. or the other flexibility yeah I, I think like i think the good thing is like we're in an era now where where the trust hurdle has been jumped over mm. like hugely right so you don't have to have a choice or you don't have a choice in terms of you have to trust your organization, right? Trust the people to be effective working from anywhere, right? And I think like we've definitely always had that approach. Um, but so if the trust thing is like that's a given now, right? You have to trust people to work from anywhere. Then for me it's just about being deliberate about well, why will I bring people into the office? And there is merit and value as well into bring for bringing people into the office for things like energy that mm. people get from being in the office. But that's, that can be, like, once every two weeks, once a month, right? People, like, we, I like the colleagues I work with. Um, I think there's a general sense in our company of people like the people they work with. So when they meet up physically, there's an energy that comes from that. And I think, I think for me, it's you need to facilitate that. You need to facilitate that. Not every day. It doesn't need to be every day, but you need to f facilitate it occasionally. And we talk about things like... Um, spontaneous collisions as well right where you in the physical office it's very different to you know if you're planning a, a, a day on zoom you know who you're going to meet for the day i've got a i've got a podcast with gary remotely at 11 i've got you know meeting joe at 12 so you have a list of people you're meeting for the day you go into the office you don't know who you're going to meet mm -hmm. and it's those spontaneous collisions with people are very um they're they're definitely uh, I suppose providers of, of great energy mm. and, and actually we're we're talking about how do we facilitate it facilitate those in the digital world as well. But I think for me it's about being deliberate about using the office or using a physical location every so often. Um but with a purpose behind it. A friend of mine runs a big kind of their content house essentially in, in London and they had a big massive office and they're like, Oh, this isn't really working because people want to be here there so what they're doing now is six week sprints they've paired it back but to a really nice office really central six week sprints people must come in for one week everyone's in there one week and then five weeks go wherever you want in the world mm. doesn't yeah. matter they get super clear yeah. and super specific for the week and then every second sprint they're going to go somewhere new so they're going to hire a big massive house in lisbon or mm dublin or wherever it is and they'll mix it up that way but i think just this flexibility and just this this difference it's exciting i think for companies in a bit of like yourselves it's exciting because mm. it can be a competitive advantage as well to people 
to attract talent, like you said. Mm. We're going to finish with a quick fire round. We've never done this before, so prepare <laughs> yourselves. <laughs> if you're listening on the audio, this will only be available on our YouTube set over there now. So, if I'll go to both of you individually for these ones, if you're not doing this, what else would you do? So, Joe, first, if you're listening on audio only. Um, I really don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. It's it's funny because I think, and uh, this is quick fire, I know, so I'm going to come up with a really long answer. <laughs> 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 the clue is in the title, Joe. <laughs> um, before Work Vivo, I would have done like lots of kind of side projects and mini like projects and things like that to kind of keep myself busy and stuff like that. But it's funny, but like with Work Vivo, it's like, that's it. Like that's that's what I'm focused on. That's what it's. That's beautiful. Doing, so. That's beautiful. Hey, Charles, be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually uh, I'm quite interested in Twitch and live streaming. So okay. I'd probably be a full time pro gamer. Twitch live stream. Not not gamer. No, I'd be like you know doing programming, uh, live programming on Twitch. I know a guy that does that. Weirdly it's enough, it's so there's a th- it's a thing. <laughs> it is a thing. I, I know I've done it myself. Um, so I find it fascinating. I'm like I've got like thirty followers or something like that. So nobody ever watches me. Class. But, um, After this, you'll have thirty five. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, um, I think I think Joe is also like we don't talk about stuff often, but Joe Joe has published two books as well. I don't know if you know that. Gary, I do not. You kept yeah, that hidden from yeah. me a whole hour. We're almost <laughs> finished. Um. I reckon Joe would be writing a lot more. Uh, Joe is a brilliant writer, brilliant technical writer as well, has a great turn of phrase, can capture things uh, in a way people can understand as well. And very, very impressive commentator on like technology trends, all that good stuff. Um, I'd re- I reckon you'd be doing a lot more writing if, uh, if, you, had l- if you had more time. Um, for me, I do, uh, I, I do coaching kids sports coaching uh, camogie um, in my spare time I'd love I'd love to be doing more of it I'd love to be doing more of it if uh, uh, I don't know if that's a career but uh, it's something I certainly enjoy and so a full time coach I'd, yeah I'd love, that. I'd love that what book has made an impact on you personally or professionally I'll go to you first Sean for this one um, probably one book that probably captures both is um, Stephen Covey Seven Habits um, and there there are I, I forget ninety percent of what I read, but there's a, there's like a few bits that I kind of cling on to, and for me, there's a template in that book that I just love, and it talks about your different roles in life, and for all of us, we we tend to we tend to see our identity through the lens of Joe's a CTO, I'm a CEO, that's our role in life, whereas the reality is, you're like for me, I'm a I'm a father. I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm a coach, I'm a dog owner, I'm a, you know, a friend. And the template guides you to, so what's your plan this week under your role as mm, friend? I like that. What's your, what's your plan for the week under your role as brother? What's your plan for the week under your role as son? And it's a lovely way to kind of balance out what you're doing in life. So it could be something very simple. In my role as friend, I'm going to, give somebody a show to go for lunch or even just give them a call or whatever. Um, but I really like that. I really like that. And I, I used to use it every Sunday night. I'm less disciplined ar- around it now, but I, occasionally I'd go back to it and I just find it, I find it very effective. Second thing in that book is, I think you actually mentioned it earlier, start with the end in mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, that comes from Stephen Covey as well. And I, I love that concept. I love that. I love that template. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rob that. Weekly reviews are very powerful. I'm all about the weekly reviews at the minute. Yeah, I'm. I'm not a big reader, so I'll. I'll probably read the book just. just Ironically, uh, as a writer, not a big reader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 um yeah, it's a funny one, but um, no, I think like on a professional level, actually, funnily, the the, the book that's probably made the biggest impact on me was when I was um, when I made my first Holy Communion. Um, this is going way back, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know where this is going. My, so I got my first computer with my with the money from my first Holy oh, Communion, yeah. and with the computer. So it was an Amst- I still remember the computer, right? It's an Amstrad CPC six one two A plus. Uh, if there's anybody who's listening who actually knows what that is, then um, then definitely reach out. But um, the the book, the the computer, it was like an ancient computer, right? So like really old. Um, but it came with a manual, and in the manual there was source code listings for games 
So there was like one for a basketball game and a tennis game and all this kind of stuff. And I was like seven, eight years old at the time. And I would spend hours like typing the code, not having a clue what it meant or what it would do or anything like that from this manual into the computer in the hope that the like game would pop up on the screen. I never got any of them to work. Um, but funnily, it's like, I, I still think of it like today. That stuck um, with you. That's like, so interesting though, how that stuck it's, there. Um, yeah, so like it's it's had a profound impact and that like it probably sparked a curiosity mm. in computing and programming and all of that kind of stuff that you know still carry today. Um, personally, I, I don't know if I can attribute it, but um, I gave up smoking in 2007 and after I gave up, I read the Alan Carr book that I don't know if it works. I don't know if I would have if I would have succeeded. Placebo effect, anyway. maybe. Yeah. All I know is that I read it and I and I had and I, succe- I succeeded in giving up. So maybe maybe there is a correlation there. But um, but yeah, they're um, two of the most abstract <laughs> recommendations. <laughs> Everyone always goes, "Oh, shoe dog, yeah, shoe dog, shoe dog." <laughs> <laughs> the, the manual for the abstract. I do like shoe dog as well, though. To be fair, so um, yeah. nope, it's too late. You've said it. You've had yours. <laughs> what other trends are you most interested in outside of work and outside of kind of the current area you're working in? So if so, you were going to start a company in the morning or just pursue a passion what other trend would you look at um or movement or area sports science probably sports science yeah very like fascinated with how scientific the whole approach to athletic performance where it's gone um yeah that's that's something that like i suppose probably combines an interest in sport and interest in technology um but yeah, it would probably be sports, sports science, sports nice. tech. Joe, I I mentioned earlier like Twitch and live streaming and all mm. that whole area. Like I'm genuinely fascinated by all of that. Like not not like I actually tend not to watch the guys who are broadcasting themselves playing video games and things like that. I actually would. There's people on there. I came across something a few weeks back where it was a person who was working, so they were just working. Mm. And there was people on there engaging, interacting, chatting, even though this person was not paying attention to them. They were just sitting there at their computer working with their microphone off, just camera on. I, I just It just fascinates me that, like, as humans, we connect with that. And and that means something. Like, there's something yeah. there. And, I, like, I don't know what it is, and I'm trying to figure it out. It's, it kind of reminds me of when I first heard of the concept of Twitch in general, right, which is... Instead of playing a video game, I'm going to watch somebody else play a video game and, t- and talk to people about this person playing video games. It sounds ridiculous, but you know now it's it's huge, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's it's a massive part of this kind of creator economy that that, that we're living in, um, and I and I find it fascinating. I think the there's kind of a lo-fi energy to it that I think you know, like I watch a lot of YouTube and all of that kind of stuff, like everybody else, but everything feels like it's kind of moving towards like highly produced, like you know, very scripted and curated content. Whereas there's something kind of raw yeah. and just real about that, like live, you know, in the moment um, uh, broadcasting that I just find really, really fascinating. So that crave for con- connection during COVID, I started doing this thing called the Power Hour every morning, eight to nine. These people just randomly all over the world, and I still do it. Eight to nine, sit down, log on. Hey, what's everyone working on? I'm going to work on this. John's going to work on that. Joe's going to work on this. Cool. See you at the top of the hour. Everyone just mutes. Yeah. Everyone works away. And it feels, just gets me in that headspace of working and accountability, what you touched on a little bit earlier. So what's the one thing you do to switch off from work? Um, Are you still too early that you don't <laughs> can't switch off yet? I, I can go first there. Um, so I don't have a choice because when I go home, um, I've got three young kids. Okay. Um, so I immediately get switched off from work and switched on to dad mode, nice. um, which, uh, which is great. Um, but I'm... I said it earlier, like, I'm a, I'm a total techie. Like, you know, when I'm not working, I'm probably doing stuff that's kind of tangentially related mm. to work. Um, I only very, in the last few days, actually, my, my seven-year-old son is obsessed with Minecraft. Okay. And I'm one of these dads who likes to understand what their kids are into and stuff like that. So I've been, like, for, for a long time, I've been going, I really need to figure out what this Minecraft stuff is all about, you know. So, um, so o- over the last week or so, I've actually like kind of gotten into it, and Jesus, it's amazing. I love Minecraft now, so <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Minecraft channel so. coming soon. <laughs> I'll link it in the bio. Like I'll be on Twitch. Day. Okay. <laughs> I watch Call of Duty all the time, so I get exactly where you're coming from. I am counting down the days till new Call of Duty releases in on November sixteenth. What do you do? 
John. Yeah, for, for me, de- actually, it's funny because the, the the games like gaming, all that, I I never got into. I couldn't like almost tried to get into it at one point, you know, because it's like what you're missing, missing out yeah. on, a, on a whole subculture, right? But uh, no, for for me, it's it's like I manage a, a sports team, right? A, a kids sports team, um, and it takes up a lot of my headspace, um, which which is great like it's just it's a it's a lovely distraction and i'm thinking about training sessions booking pitches organizing referees checking in with kids who's injured who's not you know and and it's um it's a lovely distraction but my my kids are a little bit older but my my youngest girl is 15 she plays on the on the sports team Uh, and for me it's a lovely distraction lovely distraction beautiful that's it we're done what for people listening where can they learn more about Work Vivo, what you guys do, and then about yourselves individually? Where's the best place to contact you? Yeah, so about Work Vivo, like our website, workvivo.com. We're on all the social channels. We're very active on LinkedIn, on Instagram, Twitter, all the usual places. Um, so yeah, so definitely go go, go, go check those out. Um, for me personally, I'm probably most active on Twitter. Um, I followed you this morning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I can be... Uh, I, I go from being very active to being inactive for a while, but when I'm active, I'm very active on it. Um, I'm always on there, always watching um, what's going on. But um, so yeah, so follow me on Twitter, um, on Twitch. <laughs> Your Twitch following is about I, to I didn't explode. expect you saying follow me on Twitch at the end of this conversation, <laughs> but um, but yeah, but, the beauty but of the pod. I'll definitely get a five percent uptick in my Twitch um, subscribers by the end of the show. But um, uh, yeah, and I, as John said, I, like I do write every so often, very infrequently, but like you know. I'm, pretty high um a lot of opinions about things um so <laughs> if you check my blog at joelennon.com there's um lots of opinions and if you like bad language there's a there's a good bit of it in there as well. lovely so. <laughs> joelennon.com for companies i meant to ask you this earlier what kind of companies if they're listening who can work with work vivo who would be an ideal client or what kind of solution so would that I, get? Uh, ideal clients we've we've actually i suppose we've over 350 customers now, all shapes and sizes. Uh, we have customers that have 100 employees, uh, which would be our smallest, right up to companies like Dollar General, who have 200,000 employees, Bupa, 100,000 employees. But we have everything in between. Everything in between. We've got universities, legal firms, high tech companies, hospitals, um, airlines, uh, you name it. It's every type of organization. I suppose the beauty is every organization has the challenge of trying to create that digital heart, communicating, connecting, engaging with employees. So no matter what the size, I think once you get to a certain size, and for us, it's like once you get to 100 people, that's where work vehicle becomes very relevant. I love that phrase, digital heart. Where can people learn more about you, John? Um, I'm older than Joe, so <laughs> write your letter. I, so <laughs> I, I'm usually the one who brings that up, not him. But uh. yeah, I'm older than Joe, so uh, LinkedIn is is uh, is where you'll find me. Now. I love LinkedIn; it's very powerful. Listen, John, Joe from Work People, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Gary. If you enjoy my chat with John and Joe, we do the best entrepreneurial content on the internet every single week. To subscribe, click here. To watch last week's episode, click right here. I'll see you back here next week.